calling to order meeting of the Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools uh, Board of School Directors at 7.03 p.m. Uh, start with item number two, public comment. No, perfect. Um, great, moving to item number three, uh, which is the consent agenda. And I have we have a couple things to add to the Four items agenda. to add to the consent agenda. The first is approval of a side letter with um, MESA, which is the Montpelier Educational Support Staff Association. The second item is a teacher contract. The third item is a 403B plan resolution to allow Grant Geisler to exclude, execute the new plan documents. And the fourth is an approval of a resolution to have Community National Bank change the district name and authorize Libby Bone Steel and Shelly Quinn as signers, in addition to the ones that are already listed. Great, thank you. Uh, motion to approve the consent agenda. Are you Steve, you shaved. Okay. Uh, newly shaven Steve uh, no. moves. Who's Scruffy? Who's Yeah, I'm shaved here. Okay. Yes, I move it. I will second without regard to shaving. Okay. <laughs> uh, any, any discussion? Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Great. Consent agenda approved. Uh, and then for item number four, we're very pleased to host uh, Senator Tim Ash and Senator Ann Cummings to talk about uh, the budget uh, I guess situation, <laughs> situation. Um, and uh, very happy to have you uh, you know please take a seat and do you have what you need for the TV audience in terms of audio and yeah, perfect okay, great. Thank everyone for allowing us to come and kind of talk to you. I know everyone's aware that there is an impasse at the State House and thought we would fill you in on what's happened and what we did today and what we're planning on doing tomorrow. Um, we passed uh, unanimously in the Senate, tripartisan, 9-11, um, which Last year, we used one-time money when we were in this kind of situation last year to um, be able to go home and close the books and have everything work. This year, we came back, and there was three cents of that projected tax rate was to cover the one-time money from last year, plus what the school boards voted, which was below, significantly below, what the governor said was his max, and then said, well, it wasn't. We had to do more. Um, we allowed tax rates to rise, residential tax rates, to cover. We adjusted income sensitivity, so we had ongoing money to cover the ongoing expense of that residual three cents. And we let residential tax rates rise to about 2.6 cents to cover what people had voted. Um, and we left the non-residential at um, the statutory limit, which was an increase, the statutory fallback. That was vetoed. We came back. We did H13. And that took all the, then the only thing controversial in the budget is how they're using one-time money. Mm -hmm. The rest of the budget's fine including all the, well, it was in 9-11, all the, there's a major overhaul of the income tax system, which will give back approximately $30 million that Vermonters will be paying us, thanks to the federal tax cuts, in additional income tax revenue. 
we didn't vote that, so we're giving that back to you. Um, we did 913, all that income tax, Social Security, that's all in there. Um, the budget, we took out the one-time spending, we took out um, all the tax rates, we did set a fallback tax, a yield rate, because when we went to the yield, we neglected to set a fallback. There, when we were doing the tax rate, there always was a dollar ten was the base rate, and mm -hmm. if we didn't change it, that's where we went. Uh, we said that to the governor, thinking, okay, that'll keep government open, life will be good. Um, he vetoed that. We tried for an override, House failed to override. So today, three committees, Education, Appropriations, and Finance, which I chair and is in charge of taxes, uh, met. We came up. Uh, with what we think is our last best offer, we hope. We are holding the residential tax rate flat. We are using $20 million of one-time money um, to, do, to hold that flat and to reduce the non-residential a penny. Um, that does leave us with about between a 20 and $30 million hole in 20 that we'll have to fill. But if we do what the governor asked us to do today, which is the same thing he has been asking for for weeks, um, it would leave over a $50 million hole. And that would be an easy six cent tax increase in two years. And that really does get to the heart of what the whole fight, fight, is. fight has been about. I hate to call it a fight, but that's really what it has turned into is do we use one-time money, money that's coming in because of a tobacco settlement that mm -hmm. you may have worked on, Virgin, I don't know, but a tobacco settlement with the cigarette companies and some unexpected income and corporate income revenue that's coming in as a result of the federal tax changes that are mostly believed to be one-off payments as they transition into the new tax code? Do we use all that money for one year to fulfill the governor's pledge of no tax rate increases, even though local voters have voted for the spending that support uh, that the tax rates support, or do you do what the legislature originally did, which was took all that one-time money and paid down the long-term teacher retirement obligation, which is a huge number, and we had proposed putting $35 million in for that purpose, which over time, the 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 metric is you save about three times your down payment in interest payments over 20 years. So it was going to save about $100 million over 20 years. It's not the flashiest thing to say that you put a payment in for the teacher's retirement obligation, um, but it's exactly the kind of thing that we thought uh, working with this particular administration would be desirable because it's a smart financial decision to do when you get these dollars. And so the two iterations that Ann mentioned, uh, the bill that originally, uh, well, the first bill that was vetoed, um, passed, I mean, the budget passed 29 nothing in the Senate. These were not partisan fights. The tax bill was co-written by Ann, uh, Mark McDonald, who's viewed as a very liberal member of the Senate, and Randy Brock, who's viewed as one of the most conservative. So these were not partisan. Uh, mostly people felt really good about good policy and smart moves Everyone that we were making. For um, and so what we've done today is tried to say, okay, if we had a starting point, and we were over here saying, don't use any one-time money to prop up the system, creating a crisis next year. The governor said, no, use all the one-time money to prop it up. We've come to this point. The governor's still over here, and I'll leave it at that. It, I don't mean to make a partisan statement. And the heart of, you know, when we pointed out to the administration that they had criticized using one-time money for ongoing expenses in the past, they said, well, but it's not really using one-time money because we have education proposals that are going to save so much money that it's going to effectively pay for this use of one-time money. We're never, that bill's never going to come due because you all are going to do things or have things done to you that will save lots of money. And I'll just, I just wanted to quickly point out uh, a few highlights of what was being proposed and much of what we resisted. And if you look at the bottom of page two, and admittedly, this proposal's from May 22nd, but as we said, all the variations on the theme have looked essentially identical. There's some. Uh, some slight changes, but it would not be fair to say that this was, you know, written yesterday. But you'll see the A through F at the bottom. I'll just focus on A through D because those are really the um, 
the, the, where it interacts with you folks. You'll see letter A, the increase the student to staff ratio, uh, and that also in staff and teachers. The 262 million that you see there was proposed, pro the administration projected that would save 262 million over five year period. So that's not an annual 262. The only way to achieve that number is to mandate the ratios. And that was the original proposal. It, la it had a shelf life of about a day and a half. It was, uh, I think uh, some, it didn't have the shelf life of uh, nuclear waste in Vernon. Uh, it lasted about a day and a half. And yet the administration continues to say that it will save 262 million if we, uh, through attrition, but there is no one in the education profession who has said you can achieve that money and guarantee and book it unless you mandate the numbers. Uh, in, when we've met with other uh, SUs and school boards, they've said, well, who's included in this ratio number? And actually, the answer to that is not clear because there haven't been a lot of details. We do know that two groups carved out uh, were licensed special education teachers, so not necessarily a paraeducator or someone like that, but a licensed special ed teacher would not be part of this, and contracted services. This is not a big highlight of what we're talking about tonight, but I just want to be fair that there are some theoretical uh, carve-outs of this. The legislature's feeling is that much of the reduced expenses in school budgets this past year had to come from reduced personnel expenses. If between 50 and 80% of most school district budgets are personnel costs, if school districts, instead of coming in at a projected three and a half, come in at one and a half, the money can really only come from one primary source, which is uh, less staff expense than had been anticipated. Now, is some of that happening because of Act 46? We can't say with certainty. Is some of it happening because retirements occur and as the student population occurs in certain districts, they're able to not replace a teacher but not sacrifice the, the education? That's probably happening in some districts but not others. The key piece is, is that districts are doing this work and that the mandate with a one-size-fits-all approach from Montpelier was not very popular, frankly, with any legislators. And so booking the 262 million is a real issue. Letter B, which is the special ed uh, bill. We did pass a special education bill two years ago. The legislature uh, kind of surveyed the scene and, and, and came to fully believe that many districts there was great variation in how districts were meeting um, special needs students' uh, particular challenges. We commissioned two studies, one by the University of Vermont's uh, School of Education and one uh, from a, an education consulting group whose name uh, escapes me at the moment. But they, they each produced reports which said some variation of this, which was, we can improve the delivery of special ed services by moving more districts across the state to best practices. And a byproduct of that is that we may save money doing so. An example of how they project money could be saved while improving the delivery, and I, this is way out of my depth except that this is what they said. In some districts, if a student has a reading difficulty, the district will take someone who is not a licensed reading teacher or someone with expertise in teaching kids with reading difficulties how to read better and do one-on-one -on -one during class time. The literature says the best practice, and again, I'm not saying this, this is, this is what they're saying. The literature says the best practice is that you shouldn't pull them out of the class, but that you should do extra time with them with reading, and it should be in a small group setting with other kids facing the same challenges and that the outcomes are better. So setting aside this being outside of our, our level of expertise, you could see how in, you could be achieving both objectives, delivering a better educational product, but also saving a little money at the same time. The dilemma was the administration as a way of saying that they're um, going to never face the music on the use of one-time money, projected saving $86 million in the first five years. The two studies both said that there likely will be savings. They would not materialize or accrue to the system, possibly beginning until year four, five, or even six or seven. So that booking it in the beginning, there is no one who, with expertise in this area who believes that was an appropriate or likely outcome. Statewide health care bargaining uh, had a, a fixed value of $62 million. The challenge here is that you can't say that it's bargaining and then determine 
what the financial outcome is going to be for both sides. It would be kind of a loser proposition for one party, I think, going in. So our Joint Fiscal Office reviewed the various proposals from the administration and found that some of them could save substantial money, some of them might actually cost more money, but that if it is truly bargaining, it really can't be predetermined how much money you would book as savings. And then finally, letter D, uh, reduce the excess spending threshold over five years. So right now, the excess spending penalty kicks in at 121% of the uh, average per pupil spending with some uh, carve-outs from that number. This proposal would drop it, I believe, 10 percentage points over five years. Now, how do you save $35 million? What the administration was suggesting was that every single school district in the state would, would beat the penalty threshold. So if the penalty threshold went to 119 next year, every district would fall below 119. The next year when it goes to 117, every district in the state would beat that, and so on as it ratchets down to 111. I am in, Ch in Chittenden County where I represent Bolton used to get slammed by the excess spending penalty all the time. If you've driven by Smiley School, and I was wondering if it's the same Smiley that uh, is on the front of this building oh, no. with the auditorium, <laughs> same spelling. But um, Bolton would get nailed, but they had one teacher for K through two and one for three and four. They had like a one-fifth principal. They had a one-eighth math. You know, they, they had done everything. And they wanted to actually merge and no one would take them because they were the small ones and before Act 46 no one would take them. And they would get hit each year. And the reason I mention them is to assume that every district either will willingly or can beat those is a very uh, optimistic or uh, it's probably wishful thinking. Many districts can do nothing about their scale while they're merging or doing all these other things. Others will say, we'll pay the penalty. And we've seen districts who say, we're not going to cut because we either don't think we should or whatever. So the $35 million is an issue. This document is, uh, was prepared by our joint fiscal office. Um, I mention that largely to say that legislators from all parties were asking our nonpartisan staff to analyze the various proposals and tell us that we weren't saying pick it apart and tell us it's bad. We were saying uh, evaluate it and flag any issues, holes, things that haven't been fleshed out fully, and this represents a, a pretty uh, accessible analysis of what was on the table. And we'll leave you if you, uh, you can always follow up with questions if you want. Um, and then I'll just conclude uh, my little monologue slash rant here by saying one of two, two things that have really motivated the Senate and I think the legislature as a whole. School boards always say to us, Montpelier, which is usually preceded by some other word. Well, you're from Montpelier. I shouldn't say that. I if you go to St. John's and you say Montpelier, it usually has a modifier before it. <laughs> um, but they usually say, we do all this hard work, and then Montpelier, preceded by the modifier, comes in and disrupts what we've done. And if they just leave us alone, we know how to run the district better. And you know, yes, we could use some you know, technical assistance from time to time on this or that, but don't blow up the work we've done. And the legislature, when it's been controlled by both parties, governors of both parties, have none have been pure. And I would, I'd be the first to admit I've, I've probably voted for things that have created some of that frustration. For the last two years, our goal has been to not do that, especially because Act 46 has been so hard in some parts of the state. Um, there are, there's so much difficult work going on that the last thing we feel the legislature should be doing is saying, oh yeah, you know, you're doing these impossible tasks and transitions but we're going to keep shaking the foundation that you're working on. It isn't the right way to do policy. It's not how businesses run. It's not how most successful uh, public organizations run. So we've been trying to stay out of that. The second piece is we are increasingly concerned about the long-term effects of these artificial crises in funding. Each year we hear about an education funding gap. There is no education funding gap unless we don't use the funding system to pay for itself. It's only when politicians artificially manipulate the rates that you create a funding gap. Because Act 60 and 68, for all its warts, produces the money necessary to pay for the school budgets that are voted on by voters. When politicians intervene, it creates holes. I'm not sure if this is the goal of the administration. 
some spe speculate, but it's not worth going there. But there are some who love nothing more than a sense of perpetual crisis in public education. Because then each year it's an opportunity to propose more aggressive interventions in school budgets. And that is a real problem for us. The very people who need the most help often get all their services in these schools. And we have watched schools become not only places where direct curriculum uh, is delivered or instructional assistance, they have become the primary human service organizations for young people in the state. So you actually have two budgets in one. You go to local voters to be an educational system and a human service system. And the human service piece is carving into a lot of the education part. And the last thing we want to do is say, oh, by the way, because you're doing it, meeting all these challenging kids' needs, uh, we're going to use that as an excuse to keep carving away the money you have to meet these kids' needs. So um, we're very concerned about the, the sort of perpetuation of a sense of crisis in a system that is mostly self-inflicted by politicians. So with that, I think we both love to field any questions. Yeah. If you have heard things that you're uh, wanting to know more about or things you want us to bring back to our peers to help I, influence I think the discussion. The one thing I have not heard in any of these discussions is the word quality of education. There has been no discussion. It's all tax rate, not tax bills. It's all tax rate. And it, the word impact on education, quality of education, has never been mentioned. It's all a numbers battle. Um, thank you both for coming. This has been really helpful. I was wondering if you could both speak to what's um, funded from the Ed Fund and what is not funded from the Ed Fund and whether you think that's part of the perpetual crisis that you it's described. Mine. Mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is fresh, uh, fresh, fresh <laughs> off the uh, printers. Okay. Um, the bill that went to the governor, the one we're sending him to the governor tomorrow, makes some major changes in the Ed Fund. Um, you may have heard the House did a major overhaul of property taxes and, and had an income tax surcharge, and um, it was, by the time it got to us, it was, we just needed more time to work on it. So, but part of what did go through is we made the education fund, once this bill passes in some form, completely separate from the general fund. We did away with the general fund transfer because, at least in the House, every year that's how you subsidize the education rate. You, you put more money in. Um, in return for that, and these are basically um, money neutral, we, the Ed Fund will get all the sales tax money and 25% of the rooms and, rooms and meals. We, in order to make that balance, the High School of Vermont, which is the Corrections High School, Adult Basic Ed, um, Renters Rebate, there may be one other, but the non-property tax related things were taken out of the fund. We're calling it purifying the Ed purifying. Fund. The one uh, item that originally was on the table to move was flexible pathways. That stayed. Um, we felt in the Senate that because it was often part of a high school students, uh, you know, course requirements, that it was still an appropriate education fund use. But for all the concerns in the past that we've heard about pressure on the Ed Fund because all these other programs were loaded in. What we tried to do was just undo years of uh, pressure that had mounted so that now the Ed Fund will be paying for K-12 K or pre-K through 12 education activities. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that was what motivated the question, but that's, that's what we did, are doing. All right, thanks. Michelle. Um, thank you very much. Um, we have been following some of you know what's going on and looking at the governor's proposals the um, a through f there in montpelier because we have rising enrollment and we have gone through a merger with roxbury now um, we feel like we were in compliance if you will with all of these goals mm -hmm. um, 
not because the governor told us to do that, but because we're fortunate that Montpelier is an attractive place to live. We have increasing enrollment, right. so that's great. But we meet the student to staff ratio target. We have restructured our special services delivery over the last five years and dramatically decreased the amount that we spend on that. Our health care um, agreement meets the targets that the governor has put out. Um, and we haven't hit the excess spending threshold in a long time. So um, what can we do? Well, you know, there's, interestingly so, because we've been meeting with school boards around the state trying to get feedback and better understand uh, not only how to deal with the situation we're in, but then what, what's the future look like um, in a more positive sense. Um, one of the, um, one of the, it, it might be harder to say what would Montpelier School District do in part because you've just, you're not describing a horror show scenario if these were to go into effect in part because of where you're situated. However, we do feel for the other districts because, right. oh, you know, yeah. five years ago we were in a lot of pain and things have gotten a lot better since then, but we do understand the situations that they Face, One sure. of the important things that I think um, the legislature as a whole um, often fails to truly appreciate is what positive uh, outcomes have been delivered by the school boards under normal operating procedure, right? People see, they look at student counts, they look at staff counts, they look at the total budget of per pupil number, and they think, oh, that's kind of like the metrics I'm supposed to look at. What they don't see is all the decisions that are embedded in that budget and the things you're having to do. So just to take an example, in the last few years, if you've had to meet all, uh, the needs of, of a burgeoning group of K through eight students from families with opiate issues, and there's been costs associated with that, but you've still had to have a budget that you felt good going to the public with, that might have required consent carve-outs in your budget that you didn't want to make. But people don't see that, they just see the grand total number. Because you guys, uh, having served on a municipal board, I know that not every person pays ultra-close attention to the gory details in a budget. <laughs> um, so one thing would be helpful is really to show what the trade-offs that you've had to make as you've gone through this. The other, and I, I think this has been a, a Senate focus that is starting to mature now, and I think as we head into this off-season, if we ever get one, um, we'll be talking about how to think about this is really to think about what the growing um, expenses on human services have meant to the school budget and find ways to catalog, if you will, the different um, types of expenses. A psychologist, for instance, is someone who is more prevalent today in Vermont schools than they were 20 years ago. Behavioral interventionists are way more prevalent today than they were 20 years ago. Um, uh, nurses are in many school districts, social workers. These are all positions that historically are funded through the state's general fund, through Department of Children and Families, or through insurance payments to take care of families' needs. Schools have increasingly taken that on. Even law enforcement. What's that? Even law enforcement. law enforcement, public safety. Yeah, so you've got all these expenses that really aren't what used to be in school budgets that are now competing for the same resources that you would use to do enrichment and pay for teachers and do all the other stuff and offer more courses. And so the quantification of those expenses has been really elusive. And I don't know how familiar you are with the debate over a uniform chart of account for school expenses. This is the, the like least exciting terminology you'll ever hear. Um, there has been an effort or a goal of having all schools in the state be using a common chart of accounts for accounting purposes dating back eight years. We now have the first three or four districts in a pilot, and the legislature has passed language in this bill that would say that we want all districts on it within the next three and a half years. This means that right now, if you want to know how many social workers there are in every school in the state, you can't, no one has that answer readily available. And then how districts you know, code different things is going to be different. For some schools, they're going to have it in a special ed thing. In another school district, they're going to have it in some other line, line item. I pointed out playfully, although I was a little bit perturbed when I heard about this, I said, we entered 
mobilized and won World War II in both theaters faster than it takes to get a fairly small number of school districts using the same accounting system. And I thought that was a little remarkable until I was told that, in fact, it had been already eight years in the works. And I said, okay, throw in World War I in Korea. Um, but that information will be really critical because just like we're trying to purify the ed funds, so property taxes are paying for direct uh, delivery of education, the next frontier is not forcing direct instructional money to compete with a cop or a uh, social worker or a psychologist. It's, it's, it's not what the public believes is occurring. They believe that teachers are making more money and it's too much and that's what's pressuring everything, but it's, it's really this double function. Steve. What strikes me about this is, you know, one of the things we work on a lot, I was just telling you, Republican friend of mine this, this morning at breakfast was that we're really proud in this district the way we have been able to really be looking at tax stabilization as part of what we do as a board. We're not interested in roller coasters and upsetting taxpayers. We're interested in earning that trust year in, year out. I mean, we know we have a community that generally supports education, as we do have a state that generally supports education, and but you earn that. And you earn that by producing, you know, good education and also <clears throat> talking to people about why you have to raise their taxes and doing it as modestly as you possibly can. But nobody's asking us to just, I mean, that's not fair. Very, very, very few people are saying you need to cut these taxes on schools. They just want to see this be a, a modest, reasonable, predictable, steady kind of, you know, keep around inflation kind of thing as best you can. And we've been working on that and we've been doing it. And it's good leadership and it's, we've got, you know, our, Grant has been helping us think two, three years in, in your business, manager. business manager. And you know, so I guess what I'm saying is like that's what we're doing. While we partake in Act 46 and we do, you know, we're doing every single thing we can do, complying with every rule that's thrown at us. And it feels like to some extent that I'll say the governor's office, the administration, is doing the opposite of that. They're trying to blow things open, blow it up a little bit. It's sort of and I know you're not gonna sit there and say, yes, that's exactly what he's doing, but there needs to be a sense of that it's it's a there's a plan you know to that like what you all are doing is you know we're not going to borrow a problem we're not going to solve a problem today by making a bigger problem next year because then yeah sure you have no tax increase this year but you can have a double tax increase next year and all that's going to do is not earn voters trust it's not going to earn their support of government um, or education and uh, you know we used to call it a strategic deficit. Um, it's strategic. It's it's done to destroy trust in government. Ultimately, it's the, you know, and so I will say. I mean, to me, it seems absolutely foolish from an education perspective to to not pay as you go effectively. Even yeah. the governor's latest proposal today, after joint fiscal got to crunch the numbers, they're eleven million dollars short in being able to buy down the non-residential tax rate. That's $11 million that's going to have to get cut somewhere. When I was on education, the Education Committee, we really looked into that social service and see if we can. But we've been on a starvation diet in the state budget for 10 years. There are no resources in, in the state to, to help you. Um, and if we're spending all, you know, we finally got a little revenue coming in here, maybe we could help the state colleges out so they could get their tuition more in line and maybe we could help SR, well, I don't know what we're calling SRS now. Um, DCF? DCF, yeah. DCF, yeah. Um, so that they have the staff. I mean, they're struggling with all the kids in foster care that we know are going to be coming to your schools. We have a lot of issues that we could be dealing with and the focus is only on tax rate. Even if we do what the governor wants and hold those average tax rates to 127 towns, because they're average, half the towns are going to get a tax increase. And that's because it's their average. Two years from now, the grand list is projected to go up because real estate values are going. We have a three-year rolling average. Um, if we hold your tax rate flat, your tax bill is going up. Mm -hmm. And over-collecting through the taking right. of all funding system. Right. 
And so one of the proposals, and, and this, is a, this is where things start getting a little bit like Twilight Zone, one of the, um, one of the core, core messages from the administration was, you know, it always leads with we can improve education and have way more money to do way more things, which always seems like hard to achieve all those objectives at the same time. But the term was, but was tax rate stabilization and I think what you, Steve, was talking about, you were saying that people's tax bills don't go up too much and that it's reasonable and fairly predictable. Yeah. The, if the residential tax, base education tax rate that the state sets for a residential property stays the same for the next five years, to Anne's point, because it's supposed to start going down as the grand list grows, if you keep the rate, um, from your point of view, if you keep the rate flat over the next five years, what it means is you're actually bringing a lot more money into the system what the administration proposes to spend it on itself is actually commendable, which is more resources for uh, early education and higher education. But now what you're doing is, if people used to complain about the commingling of expenses into the K-12 system and the competition within the Ed Fund that might have started, this would be like that on steroids because yeah. the early education system were like so inadequately resourced right. that you'd be collecting tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars on property taxpayers to now pay for that. Um, or for higher education. So the predictability is really the issue. The other is legislators, and maybe it's the two-year term nature of the Vermont legislature and executive branch, but like Act 46 doesn't deliver results in one year. Yeah. It's a five to 10 year process where you'll start to really see what the future is going to look like. And legislators and governors are often not patient enough to let that play out. And therefore, you see the kind of constant tweaking of the system in its stride. And we're trying to exercise some discipline, as hard as it is for us, because we're as guilty of, our, of being impatient as others. But it, it's, not, um, it's not likely to lead to success across the system if you don't let this, this new world order for our education system mature and allow the people who are implementing it to feel like their work will not be undercut um, by people making one-year decisions, which we is what we face. Uh, face just today. started realizing in the last few years that that decline in students was permanent. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, some, you know, you got this, but suddenly it was going down. And when it first started, we did the three-year rolling average. We did the, you know, phantom students. We let but it's been there so long, and the projection is it is going to continue to, to go as predictably as anything is. And so we are now trying to readjust the system which we built for baby boomers, essentially. We are now, we're trying to now change it and ratchet it size-wise in, into where it should, should be for today's reality. Um, but that's not going to happen overnight. It took us a good 10, 15 years to get here, and it's going to probably take us 10, 15 years to get out. And then there'll be another crisis. We've got a school calendar that was built on the fact that mothers are home, mm -hmm. um, and mothers aren't home. Yeah. And you know that's that is be I think anyone that's got kids or grandkids knows that is a stress. Yeah, absolutely. But as long as we're doing this, uh, you know, we, we can't have a broader discussion because it, it is just so tightly focused on the money. So I, you know, I I think Montpelier does a great job. I, you know, I've told Barry the same thing. They're trying to I can say you are the least of my problems. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we have some really small schools yes. that just don't have the resources mm -hmm. that no matter what they do can't provide the kids with the education they're going to need mm -hmm. to be productive citizens in you know in their work world um, the world of work is changing one I know Rebecca Holcomb was fond of saying a student up in the kingdom said well People used to make things, now robots make things, and people have to make the robots and maintain them. Um, but that's the different world of work. Every kid should at least know what robotics and computer programming is. Yeah. 
and an awful lot of our kids don't. So, no. but that's not in this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming. This was super helpful, and I, sh I share your concerns. I think at a time when the state needs to be having an intelligent, thoughtful discussion about you know the demographics that you talked about, which fortunately Montpelier is not experiencing. Um, I'm very concerned that the the gimmickry and the artificial crises are leading to a discussion that is not going to have the education quality outcome that the state deserves and wants. Well, one last closing point, if you'll permit it. Um, one of the things, you know, this, the state has a historical model which includes independent, uh, recognized independent schools. So if you're yeah. in St. Johnsbury, the students mm -hmm. go to St. Johnsbury Academy. And there's no one in the legislature talking about really disrupting the, the basic framework that's existed. You know, St. John's Free Academy, Linden Institute, Burr Burton, they've been there forever. Yep. There's relationships with the communities that are very rich and complex. But it is worth noting that these proposals all only affect the public schools. The public schools. So I was in St. Johnsbury the other night. They operate a K through eight school, and then the kids go to St. Johnsbury Academy. They love St. Johnsbury Academy, and they found themselves saying this very difficult thing. They said, we don't want anything to be done that would hurt St. Johnsbury Academy because our kids get a great high school education there, right? And they said, but in our effort to come in with a level funded budget, knowing that we had to pay a whatever percent increase of retail tuition price to St. Johnsbury Academy meant we had to cut the K through eight piece that they operate. So they find themselves in this in a, in a different context, but the proposals here only affect the, K, the public operating schools, which means that for all the parts of the state where you tuition at least some of your kids to some school, the only thing you have control over to keep the taxes at the reasonable level would be the public schools. And um, that is uh, a concern in yeah. lots of the parts of the state, because if you have to pay whatever the retail price is, um, you're Sorry. really at the mercy of the other part of the system. So thank you guys very much. You can, thank uh, you. Um, yeah, any, thank you. any extra info that you want to forward on to us, obviously uh, we're all yours and send it through Anne. And you know where to find me, my name, phone number's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you get to go home soon. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you. So next we're going to hear uh, from the Racial Justice Alliance uh, and the Equity Policy First Reading. Uh, so I know we have a couple of students from the Racial Justice Alliance and Principal McCrae, so please come up. And thank you for coming. And if you could introduce yourselves quickly. I'm Stella Kahn. I just graduated from high school. I'm Joellen Mensa, and I just graduated as well. Congrats. I'm Mike McGrath. I'm the high school principal. Thanks for having us um, tonight. Uh, are there any questions that you want to get started with? Otherwise, I can provide a little overview if you want. Any questions? Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. So um, basically, as you know, uh, We've been working really hard at increasing equity in our system, um, and thanks to the leadership of the Racial Justice Alliance and, and folks like these two recent graduates, um, it's really been on the radar of not only our community, but uh, far beyond. And we're really proud of, of that work, and the most visible thing being the Black Lives Matter flag. Um, I think that with their work, it's, it's sparked a, a lot of reflection about equity uh, across the board um, in our district. Uh, and uh, I think one of the big questions is, is, you know, what next? We've taken a look at curriculum. We've done some direct instruction. We've uh, done a lot of reflection and personal work. Uh, we've worked at the, the leadership level, um, attended some workshops. We've presented many times. We've had a lot of solicitations to join groups. And I mean, these two are in very high demand uh, around the state. Um, and so I, the question is just like, what, what next? And I know that the board uh, made the decision to extend uh, the flying of the Black Lives Matter flag through the end of the school year uh, to match Burlington's decision. 
um, which is great. Thank you. Uh, I'm also excited to report, and you probably know that school districts around the state uh, have made this decision, including just recently South Burlington uh, High School or South Burlington School District um, has made that decision. U32, our neighbors, U32, uh, Essex, um, and others, and many others in the wings and, and have reached out to us. And it's not just the, the flag, but uh, many principals have reached out to me around the state saying, you know, with your student leadership, this has sparked reflection in our school district, and can, can you help uh, us with some of the work that you're doing and, and what to do? So I think the, the eyes are on us, and our uh, take, our advice, our recommendation is that we move forward as a district by adopting an equity policy that has some pretty specific expectations in it. Um, you can read those over. Do you want to say anything about the expectations there? Um, I think it just dawned to the group that it seemed like um, we were doing all these little things here and there, but um, a big change isn't going to happen unless like we go to a head, and you guys are the head. And so we were... Um, we would really appreciate it if you could take a look into the policy and deeply consider what we recommended. I will say that I think that the heart and soul of the policy is on target, and the specific wording probably needs work. Um, we were editing just as recently as yesterday, so the version you have isn't even um, the latest iteration of, of what we think. Uh, I was, I didn't really, I'm pleasantly surprised to see it in the first reading already, um, but I think that it needs some, some editing and some support from, from you all and, and anyone else that might have expertise in that area. Um, there's no model policy at the state level as far as I know. There's been a lot of work at the state level of potentially passing some new laws in this arena, um, and we're hopeful to see one of those go through too. But the actual language, I, we weren't working off of an existing template. So it, it could use some work, probably, but we think that the general, general idea is on point in some of the specifics we also feel strongly about. Um, Yep. Any questions? Yeah. I have a question about the equity spectrum that you've listed. So would that be a uh, whole person? Would that be somebody that's here that is in part time? We were hoping that you would um, hire someone full time to work along with the, uh, the director of curriculum to remodel our curriculum to make it increase. So it would need to be if that extra person is not in this year's budget, right? So it would need to be something we thought about in the future. Thank you. Um, in the meantime, um, you could have seven currently on the staff. Okay, you, say, you mentioned professional development in here, mm -hmm. instructional criteria and curriculum <coughs> updates and so we our new curriculum director can roll up their sleeves and work with you on that. Um, I'd be glad to, outside of Vermont, I think this would be a pretty standard piece of policy in most other school districts of any kind of diverse nature whatsoever. Um, so you were not, you're starting from scratch with this, you didn't have a template? No, okay. Not from scratch. I mean, there are other things out there. Sure. But we didn't just cut and paste another school district in. Yeah. And there was or yeah. there was actually some pretty extensive research done on on schools that have done work with equitable policies. Yes. And Good. it's pretty sparse. There's really? not a lot of it. Um, we found a school in Toronto. And I think maybe a couple of schools in the United States. Well, I'm originally from Atlanta, so I think part of what happens with really diverse school districts 
is that this is so embedded into how they're structured originally and it happened 50 years ago that they don't have to they don't <coughs> have this have to have this in writing like we do here I think we do need a, a, a specific identity to this issue here I agree with that um, one of the things you say you're still editing this yeah, yeah, I mean, for example, there's there's some things that are sort of low-hanging fruit on the edit. Like I said, mm -hmm. I was pleasantly surprised to see it in the first read already. Um, but the first line is Montpelier instead of Montpelier Roxbury. I mean, yeah. there, there are things like... We're like doing that. it all over yeah. the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, there's, there's some things that are pretty obvious. And then, you know, I think with expertise and more eyes, there are other things that should probably be considered. Okay. Are you working on this just the, the three of you, or do you have board involvement working on it, or how um, is that going Yeah, we, we reached out to, to Bridget as okay, well. Good. She's been helpful. Good. 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 Thank you. Michelle. Um, I would move that we give this to the policy committee to develop. Good. That's what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve, do you have a, are you seconding, or do you have a no. question? I'll second. All right. I'll second. All right. Well, discussion, so go. A um, couple thoughts. One is um, it's a little more granular than we normally do for policy, but there are, we have done that, and we find it sometimes. So normally on a policy, we might use like the first three paragraphs of this or something, and then stop. Um, the idea being that it has to, the policies are kind of like constitutions, they hang out for a long time, but that the, the actual implementation of them keeps changing and keeps changing and keeps changing. But sometimes we go a little further and put a little more detail in because we don't want to lose track of the detail. We think it's so, so good or so important or essential to the, the mission that we, that we have to keep it in there. So I think it's just a decision for a policy committee to think about how deep do you go and if you did want to tighten it up a little bit what might you pull out and what might you leave with that idea in mind. The other thing I was thinking, though, is that we are about to embark on a, um, a process of developing a school mission and mm -hmm. um, some ends policies, which are our really high level policies of like, where do we want this district to, what do we want to achieve as a district for all students? Those are real high level, and sometimes they're things like, well, everybody's going to be really, you know, going to pass all the standardized tests or whatever, right? But I think, from my perspective, mm -hmm. what this community's values are and are developing into is that this kind of a document, we may want to make this even more front and center as part of our, of our district's very reason to exist. Seems a little, little pokey maybe, but not really, right? Like the idea here is equity and justice and this concept of justice being articulated in our district. That, that justice is one of the reasons we that this public school district exists, is that we want to achieve a level of equity and justice. And so we may want to go a little further than this in the end and actually think about if we're only going to have three or four ends policies for which we stand effectively that this may be one of them, or something, some piece of this may be one of them, or written right into our pithy one-liner mission statement is something about this. So, I mean, I would really advocate that we think about public schools um, as that social justice movement, as a part of our social justice movement, and that this is part of it. So I just throw that out there, because maybe policy committee needs to have that as context if we are going that direction. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I will add on to uh, what Steve has said to say, even though it might be the first three paragraphs that are the policy, generally we have procedures of what we would follow to carry out that policy. So some of this would not necessarily be laws. It would just be in another document which would be procedures of how is it carried out, the big idea, how is it carried out. Yeah, I, I just to add to that, I, I think that having a process to carry out these values is very important because um, I think it's something that the district needs to do very intentionally. And I like your suggestion, too, of also getting them to the high level when we have our mission. Yeah, it's not a substitute for this. Position. This yeah. still needs to no, be forward. Absolutely. Uh, another suggestion I have before you, um, would it be worthwhile having 
um, a student from the Racial Justice Alliance sit in in those policy discussions with the policy committee. I think that would be yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And if you would allow more than one student, I, I, as many as as you, would, yeah, it would be great. Um, just a couple more things. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, really appreciate what I feel like it's going to be support. The vote didn't happen yet um, to move to the policy committee. I think that makes the most sense um, for it to move there. Part of what's written there is this question about taking down uh, what is a really important symbol for us and, and beyond. And what, what we're proposing with this piece is that um, that the flag remains up until the policy is in place. And so that would mean, you know, mm -hmm. likely through the summer and into the fall. And I think that that's, that's appropriate. Um, I need a motion on that. Yeah. So let's to do a first motion and then, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, any further discussion on the, the motion? motion? Yeah, the, the motion. Put it to yeah, the policy, policy, policy I was committee. trying to remember when Michelle or Steve made it. Um, no? All those in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? And do you want to make a, someone want to make a second motion? I'm happy to. I think uh, if I understand what you're asking for, um, and maybe is that um, that the Black Lives Matter flag stay flying at, uh, at Montpelier High School <coughs> until we have a policy uh, enacted um, that, uh, that addresses not just the gesture of the flag, but that the but the meaning of, of the flag and the reason that that flag was initially flown, so that we're actually replacing a symbol with action. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I was going to discuss, but. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, Thank you. you. Opposed, discuss? <laughs> Guess it's too late. <laughs> Sorry, Michelle, I didn't, I didn't see your hand. I, I just want to remind us that we want to be cautious about responding to mm -hmm. requests. And but too late. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and thanks for your great work on this. Is, this is a, a good piece of, of policy. Thank you. Good night. So we are amazingly exactly on schedule. Um, uh, so for item number six, uh, we have Jay Erickson and Tom Wood who are going to uh, give us an update on the Union Elementary School playground and the bids that came out. So, uh, I'm Tom Moore, Director of Facilities for the Mountain uh, Public Schools, and Jay Erickson, who's the Project Manager of the Union Elementary School Playground Project. And uh, we want to just be able to update the board, keep you in, uh, up to speed in terms of where we are with the process of getting that project started this, uh, or this summer. Uh, so we received three qualified bids on June 15th, and they were all significantly over budget. So we've been working with a low bidder to try to go through a, uh, a qualified conversation with him in terms of value engineering to try to identify components that we could do um, uh, in order to bring the project down to the allotted budget. And the process has been going well, the conversation's going well, but it's taking a little bit of time to get the, uh, the information from all the subcontractors and all the material suppliers to get all the information to be able to offer a hard number and a hard schedule to, to the committee to make, take action on. So in conversation with the uh, ECI Engineering Contractors uh, Incorporated of Willison, they were the low bidder. Uh, we had a lengthy conversation with them this morning, and schedule is as important to us as the, the bottom line, the price. And uh, you know, they've committed that they are, they are ready and mobilized, and, and they had, when they originally bid the project, anticipated starting construction uh, uh, basically on the, the third week of July mm -hmm. and they're still committed to holding that schedule and allowing us a week or two to sort out the details of what the final scope and the, and the contract value is going to be and uh, that dovetails pretty closely what we were anticipating with all the regulatory processes that we're still uh, finalizing 
the, uh, you know, the one critical date that we're watching is the final appeal period on the CAP, uh, the corrective action plan for our soils, uh, which has been, has been approved and has been warned. The uh, appeal period for that expires on uh, July t uh, 11th. And so that was kind of uh, the operating date that we were anticipating to be able to, to roll equipment and start construction once we knew that the appeal period had expired on the, on the, uh, the soil's corrective action plan. Um, but, you know, in, in general, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very complicated project, as we all know. There are a lot of variables in it. There's a lot of uh, development in the design and the features that the, the team has created. And they're trying to go through a, a relatively thoughtful process in terms of how to part back to keep it on the, the scheduled budget and not just come in with a, a cleaver and start, uh, you know, taking off large pieces of it. So they're trying to be very prudent, very selective in terms of how we manage the, uh, the, the value engineering process and making sure that we hang on to uh, the project as we've all been uh, anticipating it. And my expectation as I've seen, you know, the elements that we're still waiting to get pricing on is I think it's reasonable that we're going to get down to very close to where the budget is and then we'll be able to have a much more meaningful conversation in terms of what that contract value is and how it relates to the rest of the bond projects. I'd be happy to answer any any general questions. Um, uh, I'm curious to know if at that time when you get it all figured out with the board, have something that shows us what you did between uh, absolutely and, and the prices this time. Yeah, eventually what we're going to need to produce is a very uh, rigid set of contract documents with the with the builders you know so the, the drawings will all be uh, amended and documented in terms of what the actual contract represents so we can make a presentation in terms of the finished product I mean, what we're purchasing and what we're getting for that money and uh, I'd be happy to go through and articulate the changes that we made uh, so that you can understand where where the money was was taken out of the project uh, because people will ask. yeah and it's a fair question, and uh, you know, until I have you know the specific information, uh, you know, I don't want to kind of tip the scales one way or the other in terms of what what those elements are. No. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, what specifically will you need from the board in order to make sure that you know the shovels in the ground on July 9th? And because I know we have a very tight. Tight construction season. There's a lot that yeah. needs to get done before people start going back to the building. Was it August 23rd? Is when when teachers will populate the building. Yeah. So what? I, I see. We our next meeting is July 11th. So are we going to need to meet sooner and approve this? I'm honestly, I'm not sure yet. I'm not. I would like to think that it would be possible. I don't want to promise the world that we'd have everything wrapped up here by the end of June and be able to warn an extra meeting. I, I don't know if that's necessary. Uh, ECI has been very good to, to talk with in good faith. You know, they are continuing to proceed as if this project is starting on their, on their timetable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and unless they need a written letter of intent, you know, I, which they have not asked for, uh, I think we can just proceed in good faith that they, they'll hold the schedule and they know the, the criteria that was laid out for them. You know, so it's, that was you know part of the conversation this morning about the, the schedule implications and the start of school is, is a fixed date and they know yeah. that they need to be able to provide temporary egress and exit out of the uh, the doors that are in the project area, and they're well aware of that they presented two or three different options for how they're planning to mitigate that if and when that day comes they didn't get as far as they anticipated so they've got a, a plan A a plan B and a plan C already in anticipation of how to make sure that that works. Because that, that, that's a given. It, it has to work. There's no, no fallback there. The school opens when school opens. And uh, you know, we need to be legal about that in terms of the number of egress points and the, the paths the kids have out of the building to the public sidewalk. So. Uh, Steve, do you have your hand up? Just, um, Jared, I'm wondering if maybe you can help us with this, too, is where, where do we sit with uh, the structure of the committee and how these decisions will be made? And Tom, you should obviously leave this. But where are we at in terms of, you know, do, do we have uh, the parents and volunteers who've been a part of this, are they feeling like um, they've got a good sense of kind of as we make these value engineering decisions and cuts in some cases, where, how, is, how are you out working as a group? You want to start or? <coughs> Why don't you, I mean, because you Sure. Were, uh, 
as you probably are aware, the, uh, the UPP has formed a pretty active community group of parents that, that were involved in the creation of the design. And, and there's probably still four or five members there that are actively involved through this process as well. I mean, we've had two meetings where we've removed, reviewed the information that we have to date uh, as a group and been able to have some dialogue and some feedback. This information has been shared with them via email so people have the documentation. People are waiting for you know, numbers attached to the different scopes of work so that they can actually make some comparative choices. And that th those conversations will probably happen at the end of this week or, or the beginning of next week as soon as we get the information back from the contractor with hard numbers against it. But they'll, be, they'll involve the, those two or three, four they will. whoever's involved in this. So and they have been. They have yeah. been, yeah. Since we received the bids. Yeah. yeah. Including, I'll say, uh, Andrew LaRosa. I mean, he's come to the past two meetings, and uh, he's been productive in terms of understanding the scope and the magnitude of the project and, and participating as well, you know, so that we're trying to you know, make a smooth transition in terms of how that works as well, as I will probably stay on until you know, the July 11th board meeting. If that's what it is, I'd love to be able to come and, and be part of that presentation as well, yeah. just to yeah. kind of close that, that gap. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important to add too, and obviously if anybody has any specific questions about the progress of the project, but it, I think it's good to know too that a lot of the, the ancillary work that's happening around the bid process is well underway and making excellent process so that, or progress rather, so that we're hitting the ground running and getting as prepared as we need to be for the start of school. So the, the nest, which is the outdoor uh, classroom and play structure that was designed um, and built by a Norse professor and her students is done, it's built, and it's been moved. It's in the backyard right over here. Um, and it's just waiting to be placed. Um, I've also spent a significant amount of time with uh, a committee of uh, current administration, uh, faculty and staff at Union to help visualize and plan for exactly what um, recess will look like throughout the next throughout uh, the next school year. A big part of that is then also my work working with the city, including the city manager, uh, police chief, fire chief, um, building inspector, director of public works to make sure we have everything in place to, we, and, I, we have, and I've submitted an application to close Park Avenue during the school year next year. And um, we've had site visit and, and multiple meetings on exactly what the specific impact of that will be to uh, the local community. Everybody's on board with the plan that we've put together, all those officials that I just mentioned. And now, I'll, based on the, their feedback, I'll be updating that plan and permit application, submitting it to the city council, resubmitting it to the city council, and will likely um, uh, present not at the, their next meeting, but the one after that. So which is three weeks from tonight. So, but all of those folks are, help develop the plan, and so it's, it's we're very much, um, you know, there, there's a lot of support to, to make sure this is in place by the time that uh, school starts next year. Another big piece of that, too, is working with Tom McCarville and, and Public Works to resurface Park Avenue mm -hmm. um, and the sidewalks on Park Avenue and the sidewalk along um, where the parent drop-off is on uh, Loomis Street, on the kind of the corner of school in Loomis, to make sure that um, uh, that it, it's smooth and appropriate for kids who are you know UES aged to be able to play on. So, yeah. Tina. Uh, I'm assuming we also that when we think about any permits or anything we need to proceed with this, I'm assuming this hold up Six weeks or something for some permit to come through there. No, I mean all the uh, the stormwater, the state building permits. I mean those are all in place. So there, and yeah. those Thank appeal you. periods have expired. So the one we're waiting for is just the uh, you know the appeal period on the cap. What about uh, communication out to the community and parents? Because I know even if everything goes super well, it's gonna be a bit of an inconvenience and disruption for you know, both local residents and then you know, students and, and parents. So. Yeah, and, and you know, Chris, Chris Hennessy has um, done uh, a handful of communications out to parents already. Um, uh, I've met with the new principal and right. we've talked about a plan for how we're gonna communicate over the summer. As, as this plan has been sort of been finalized over these last few weeks with with the city to be able to communicate what that will look like. There will be shifts to the um, sort of soft start of school um, because mm -hmm. 
you know, when kids can be dropped off and all of that. Um, we've uh, also been working with Dan Courier, the Regional Planning Commission, who's had a transportation there, around trying to reduce the overall imp traffic impact around drop-off time and looking at potential um, remote drop-off points and, and bringing kids in that way as well. So we'll be communicating. Um, uh, we have a, we're building a plan to communicate to parents over the summer. We've also had, we, we had a, a required meeting for the corrective action plan that we hand delivered letters to all the neighbors, mm -hmm. um, letting them know. Then we also had another meeting for just the abutting properties for folks who are, you know, the, the who are affected right outside their front door and, and then a little bit, you know, half a block in each direction um, to talk about what closing Park Avenue would look like. Um, and in the end, the plan that we've, we've um, established with, uh, with the city around closing Park Avenue will affect three off-street parking spots. That's all. You, all the, the homes that are on the upper end of Park Avenue will not be affected. Um, I'm happy to talk more detail on what that will look like, but it, I don't know, we need to talk about it tonight. But, so then I'm working now specifically with the folks who are, kind of have those three spots and working on alternatives to make sure that they have on-street parking as close as possible and then off-street parking for, you know, when there's parking bans or if they want yeah. to be off-street at night, et cetera, so. Great. And that will, you know, that, as that plan, certainly when, once the, I've updated the street closure permit, that will go out and, you know, be worn and there'll be public comment and uh, opportunity for, for feedback at the, at the city council meeting. Um, and ultimately, it'll be, it'll be up to them to decide. But like I said, we're trying to get have everything, the plan, uh, as far along as possible um, before we go there. Yeah, and I'll say it's a pretty comprehensive plan, taking a look at you know how trash removal works, how the mailman works, how the FedEx package comes. I mean, there are a lot of scenarios that we have to kind of run through mm -hmm. the, the model to make sure that the street can still function. Yeah. And it's a, it's a pretty interesting exercise to watch. Yeah. Yeah, I, and, and I, I, will, I will say this, I've been very appreciative of the collaborative nature of the folks in the city to help make this work. And really, um, from the beginning, the bottom line is uh, the number one priority is the safety of the kids. Yeah. Number, the, and then everything else falls into place after that. And so we've, we've really been on the same page around making sure that that safety is, is key. Um, and, that, and that also we're just very cognizant we're being the best neighbors we can be with the folks near us. So, so the fire trucks can get in. And the fire trucks will be able to get in, yes, yes, if they need to. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Well, thank you very much. This is uh, good to hear. And again, if you need board action sooner than July 11th, uh, be in touch and we'll, we'll try to put something on the calendar so this, the timing on this obviously is very important. We appreciate Great. that. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jan Top. So now we're on to policy readings. Um, at number seven, first reading student self expression. So I just sent all of you an email. Bridget had asked for me to send as reference the 16 VSA um, 1623, which is the reference for this policy. And I apologize that it's not in a, hand, a handout right in front of you. Um, but I pulled it up in this boilerplate from the VSBA is essentially what was written. Um, and I believe it was passed at the end of the last legislative session last year. Um, so this protects students from having a reasonable amount of self-expression um, with the limitations that are listed below in terms of implementation. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have about this. Any questions or comments on the student self-expression policy? I had two small comments. Um, in the second paragraph, it says, no expression made by students shall be deemed to be an expression of school policy, mm -hmm. which seems like a weird thing. That was somewhere in this legislation. I'm trying to find it. I mean, I'm I could see too. saying no expression made by students is an 
expression of the district or is made on behalf of the district. But I don't understand your question. Just that, why would anyone imagine that something a student said was creating a policy? You know what I mean? It's, 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 it's just I think not it's to be that. taken as right. a statement of right. the district. But. Right. All right, well, you guys can sort that out. And on the back side, the first sentence is um, content in school sponsored media will not be restrained solely because it involves political or controversial subject matter or is critical of the school or administration. And I understand that sentence, but. Um, the position of solely and the use of solely to me is slightly ambiguous and I would remove solely and put at the end of that sentence unless it also violates any of the conditions one through six listed above. So both, I'll, I'll just report out that both what you just referenced right there is yeah. specifically from the law as is um, your first question. Your first question is answered in letter J of the law that says no expression made by students in, in school sponsored media shall be deemed to be an expression of school policy. And the note was that it was added and effective May 23rd, 2017. And this sentence here is also um, at the end of a section that begins a school is prohibited from subjecting school sponsored media other than that listed in subsection E, which you just referenced. Um, to prior restraint. It may restrain the distribution of content um, described in subsection E, provided that the school's administration shall have the burden of proving lawful justification without undue delay. And then that last sentence that you just cited is right from the statute. Yours is consistent. Okay. I, think, I think what you said is consistent. Yes, I was just rewording the same thing. Well, I, I think yours is actually better because it's even more consistent with the law. Not, I mean, forget the, the language. It's, it's more Clear. consistent with the policy, actually. It's specifically mm -hmm. referencing the thing that shall be the reason. Right. I'm not sure about that. It says in less one through six in the state law. I'm not sure. I, I would want to spend more time with the statute. Agreed. I mean, this, this will be my concern, which is that there, there may be situations in which it's not a, a restraint of the school sponsored media, but it's just not that the school sponsored media is not for that purpose. Like, say, the school sponsored media is a poetry journal, and somebody says, I want to submit these photographs that are, you know, critical of, or, you know, make some political statement. And, and the poetry is like, this is a poetry journal we're doing. You know, we're doing poetry. I think the statute as a whole allows for some of that kind of content entry, but I'd want to spend more time with it. But that might be one of the reasons why this doesn't say. I thought it you can only, only allowed us to restrict based on one through six. Whereas this sentence opens a wide door. Where you could restrict for any reason as long as it's not solely one of those reasons. That's right. That's the word. It could be one of these reasons and another reason. I was thinking that what this sentence said is that a teacher can't restrict something just because it's controversial. Right. They, and the implication is that that's consistent with the fact that they can only, they have to stick with these six conditions. Doesn't that seem a little odd? Like I would suggest that you can't have that. You know, like a, a science I, journal. I think, <laughs> that's, I think that's what it's suggesting. I want you as my attorney if I'm a student wanting to get a photo into it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, but the law is pretty clear about this. Can I drink it this one through six? Would anyone object if I just tried to take a little look at it before it came back for the second read? No. Nope. Consider these solely versus. 
Because I do agree that solely is ambiguous. <laughs> I don't know, no disagreement with that basic. I don't know, we've raised questions about terms in the past in some of these policies. Do you know why the legislature decided to use student journalist instead of just simply student in this policy? Uh, the definition here, it says, means a student enrolled at a school who gathers, compiles, writes, edits, photographs, records, or prepares information for dissemination in school-sponsored media. In school-sponsored. Which could be most students at any point in time, but... It, well, yeah. school-sponsored. I think in that it's yeah. like, it, it seems that that's pointing directly towards a product of some kind that the school is saying, hey, this is ours. Yep. Young, young Elisa Braun co con contributed to this as one of our student journalists, therefore labeling it as such. Nice job turning my two children into one. Yeah, I missed on that. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing is that thanks to the reading of that, there I see a typo. A student journalist um, is a student who gathers, complies, writes, Ooh. edits. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Another is, I think there was actually a court case. supposed to be compiled, right? Mm -hmm. There yeah. was actually a case in Vermont, I think in Franklin County somewhere, of a student who wrote for the school newspaper and then got, wrote something um, critical of the school in the school paper and then got in trouble for it and then got un in trouble as a result. Mm. So I think we've, I think a Vermont school has been down this road and that's probably why they call out mm. student journalists. Um, and in that same sentence, didn't it just say in the district, since we're not a supervisory union? Yes. And above in media advisor as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And down below, at the bottom of the list of six things, it says supervisory union again. That should be one of our terms of our final uh, word search. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions about student freedom of expression? I would like to know how district staff is supposed to decide if it violates federal or state law. It seems like a, that's like a tough standard, but anyway, I know it's in the statute, so. So the problem with the solely thing is simply that if we, if we parrot the statute, we create nonsense, but we should still parrot the, the statute. We don't have to, as well, long as we say the same thing. We don't have to use the same No, words, but it's, right? I don't, I guess it's the wrong word, but if we don't, solely doesn't, isn't consistent with the statute, ultimately. It's broader than the statute. The statute is, is restrictive. The restrictive statute is nonsense, and yet it is the statute. And so we should do it even though we may find reasons that we have to do it because it's a photograph. So I just think there's a logical problem there, but we don't have the freedom to really broaden it to add number seven, which is photographs in a poetry term. <laughs> um, so solely may be our end run. It may be our using vagueness to avoid nonsense. I mean, since it's a brand new statute and they told us to adopt a policy consistent with the statute, I would lean towards following the statute. You would? Yeah, but I'm happy, you know, I think we should think about it and see. Talk about it again next month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have to think about it next month anyway. So. Discussion? Are we ready to move on? Great. Um, 
Eight, second readings of Title I Comparability, Animal Dissection. Title I Parental Involvement Compacts, uh, Board Member Conflict of Interest. Uh, Brian, give a quick overview. Yeah, Morgan. so I, I, as I put in the memo, um, we are still required for both the Title I Comparability and the Parental um, Compacts. Um, Essentially, the way that our lawyer boiled it down to me was, and I put that as at the bottom um, of Title I Comparability, essentially we must always give, at least give to one of our K-4s what we're giving to our other K-4, regardless of how that shakes out. I know exactly what you're going to, I, and I, well, I, I think I've got it now, Brian. Go ahead. L let me try. Um, and what I was confused about was the issue of pass -through. And I was thinking of it as yes. state. And if you read this, I'm trying this for Bridget. If you read this to say that you must equal out services, materials, everything else for local and state funds for all your schools, it must be comparable and equal in all the schools. And then the federal, see they don't speak, the federal money, which is Title I, comes in and adds to in the case of the Title I. So Correct. that's where I was getting lost in the Correct. state money. So you even out everything, and then the Title I is above and beyond that, but it's federal funds, not local or state. Correct. Uh, so, the, so, so the Title I school ends up with extra funding it from does. the federal pass through. From the federal, but the school district has to the state. Right. Thank you, Tim. And we are still both, both K4, both K4s are still Title I eligible, just at different amounts. Yeah. So, right. um, and then the, what Cindy Kahneman told me was the Title I Parental Involvement Compacts, um, those samples were from previous iterations under No Child Left Behind. Um, and therefore, at this point, since there are so many intricacies in terms of the money and the pass-through, it was her recommendation to not have those models in there any further. You may have remembered Title I more um, recently under No Child Left Behind, at least the way it manifested itself here in Montpelier, we would often get requests from Montpelier resident, non-enrolled students in Montpelier public schools when we did not meet adequate yearly progress, which no longer exists now under ASA, if they were going to one of our private school um, counterparts in town would come to us and say, well, since you didn't make AYP, we're eligible for this money, and we would have to set up a system to have that happen at one of our private school counterparts. Um, that doesn't exist currently. We are going to targeting and ranking, but we don't know what that looks like yet. The plan that was accepted by um, the Federal Department of Education um, says that the state will rank in those schools that are in the bottom 5% statewide will all be in a corrective action of some kind, and we suspect that that will be manifested some way in some of our Title I funding. But since the specifics have not yet been laid out, um, it was Cindy's recommendation to strike the um, model compact that's there and instead stay with the language. So. Um, I hope that clarifies some of the questions that arose at the last meeting regarding Title I. <clears throat> Bridget. Um, I'm just trying to do the, some of the wordsmithing. Mm -hmm. um, so is the first shall, should that be a must? Is that a, I read that as a duty that the school district must provide comparable yes. services. Mm -hmm. So that one should be must. And then I would say that the next two are probably wills. They're descriptive. But the will you mm -hmm. see, are you now in? Comparability. Same one. Oh, OK. Um, the, actually, all the next three would be mm -hmm. wills. And then I think the last two would be, those are duties of the superintendent. Mm -hmm. So that would mm -hmm. be a must. It's describing a duty. Is that what we're getting at? Policy? <laughs> so those are just little bit okay. shells, tools, and musts. Yep. Okay. Other questions, comments? Animal dissection?
hearing none. Uh, Will you wordsmith mm -hmm. the animal dissection? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, title one, parental involvement compacts. Nope. Same. Mm -hmm. okay, thanks. Same. And finally, uh, D, board member conflicts of interest. Do they just announce it as such and refuse themselves from any discussion of anything? I mean, it, it, some of it reads like if other people perceive a conflict of interest of a board member, the board member themselves knows of it. I think just, avoiding conflicts covers it. It okay. doesn't really have a mechanism other than just abstaining. Mm -hmm. Just ask what I would think to recuse, yeah. just, yeah. just to acknowledge it and recuse it. Okay. Right. I mean, I think mm -hmm. the typical standard is that you don't participate in the discussion. Mm -hmm. That's right. Or yeah. the vote. Or the, or the vote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. And then we have, um, could I just ask a clarifying question before we go on to student yeah, 10? Go so, um, save for the changes from shalls to wills, Am I correct in presuming that Title I Comparability, Animal Dissection, Title I Parental Involvement Compacts, and Board Member Conflict of Interest will be ready to adopt at the next meeting? Yes. Yeah, it should be. Okay, thank you. So item nine, uh, policy third reading for student attendance. So I hope this explanation is helpful. Cindy and I went around this a number of times to try to get at the definitions. Um, so to step through what we're, I started with a legal pupil, which is in italics, um, and that's just in Vermont statute. This board has decided that the date um, to be admitted to kindergarten is September 1st. Students is, go ahead, Jim. Um, I actually had a question about that. Like, sure. we're a new district, have we? Well, we had to for the purpose of enrollment for okay. this year. I mean, okay. you can choose something else okay. as you I go just, forward, but we we had to stick with one for to get people in the okay. door for, I just to make for sure the fall. We'd actually done that. Okay. <clears throat> so students, as a broad term, can apply to pre-K students who, as you all know, can either attend at the Roxbury Village School, at Union Elementary School, in one of two half-day programs, or be a part of um, a partnership in which they can come to the district and get a voucher. They're not legal pupils in that case because they haven't reached the age, but they are enrolled <laughs> students. Um, and so that's how we've tried to step from one to the next to the next. And then obviously enrolled students are both legal pupils and actually in, in this case, one of the pre-K-4 buildings or our 5 through 12 buildings. So I hope that's clarified some of the questions around the different uses of the words in both the statute and the policy. Bridget. So I had a couple of wording things I wanted to suggest in the second sentence could we take out the multiple uses of school district because it's kind of unreadable so could it be students between the ages of 6 and 16 and who are residents of the district and non-resident students who enroll in district schools are required to attend school for the full number of days that school is held that way we avoid saying school five times Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then in the next sentence, could it be enrolled students who are under age six or over the age of sixteen? Because yeah, I think as it's read, it's like under a, age six and over age six. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right. Sometimes that's, I think you know you could have a, one. That's a narrow category. <laughs> of people. Actually, can I get a question in on this point? Um, so we make the statement here, over the age of 16 are required to attend school continually. 
Ryan, in the memo you had stated students over 16 are supposed to attend school if they are enrolled. Mm -hmm. um, so do I, so we're going from required to supposed to? No, 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 so that, I mean that's the, the, your policy is, is stronger. Okay. And that's, that's okay. I just wanted, I, to, I think, I just yes. wanted to make no, no, sure no, no, that's right. This was not, yeah. right, 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 right. So okay. the policy is stronger than what? I'm good with it. We just wanted to make sure <laughs> yes. there that there wasn't. Very clear. Okay. Yes. And then um, if I could go on, on the, so, on the truant officer, um, do we do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Officer, no, Corporal Nisley. But I mean, the board actually does that at some point? I knew we had one. I just didn't, I didn't actually recall being asked to appoint. I think I do, I do it on your behalf. So, um, can we say that instead? You sure can. I mean, is there? Well, the vice chair shall serve as the term. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just gets worse and worse. <laughs> uh, what we say the superintendent will appoint one or more individuals. Annually, the superintendent must appoint one or more. I mean, as long as that's legal, I would say that's a must. That's a duty of the superintendent. And ensure that the appointment yeah. is recorded with the clerk. clerk. Why is it recorded with the clerk of the school district? That I do not know the answer to. Okay. And then I think the shall develop should be must develop. Jim, you sounded like you had a question. Well, I did have a question. It's, it's maybe a bit on the academic side, but um, what does it mean to require students who are not legally required to attend school? Does that just mean for the purposes of, I mean, if someone's enrolled as a 17-year-old and they decide that they don't want to come, we really can't do much other than not give them credit for whatever they're enrolled in. Right. Yeah. I mean, okay. There, I mean, there are natural consequences to that. They didn't yeah. get a diploma. They didn't. Yeah. And, or, you know, I mean, in, in the reality of flexible pathways, that does, there is some freedom that's granted with that. So that could be still a path to graduation. Or it could be they're no longer enrolled. Right. Yeah. It's Correct. Really. Yeah. And that distinction is a good one. Right. Okay. So assume we have changes and we'll have mm -hmm. a fourth reading of this mm -hmm. uh, next time. Any other? Uh, Any other questions or comments on number nine? Uh, just a little something, just and I'm not sure. Brian, you had said that you're going, you have to go with September 1. I think everything makes sense this time. Correct. Has there ever been a board of action on that? That um, the establishment, since I don't think it's a state law, what's the. So the board action took place. Michelle, you want to help me with this? We had w at least one that came um, just to the MPS board. I believe you were on, and the board well, affirmed. The, the MPS policy, that we had a, a policy that right. referred to right. that date, mm -hmm. and we did consistently stick with that date, mm -hmm. but that's MPS. You're right, so in answer to your question, there was no statement by this board in terms of September 1st. I do know that Roxbury uses the September same date, 1st as well. and so yeah. for the purposes of just operating for next year, that's what we went with. That's so good. I just wonder whether we need to perhaps in something. perhaps in July. That be. I don't know which policy that was in, but it was in a policy. I think Roxbury said it every year. It came to the board that they declared September first each year. Um, I, I think you should declare it or have it in a policy nonetheless. So when someone agreed. comes to agreed. disagree, this one. Mm -hmm. it could it could go. Mm -hmm. Right, if I ask real quick, mm -hmm. administrative rules and procedures, two got added to the list for this reading, the J and the K, mandatory attendance and truancy. Mm -hmm. Were those new procedures or? Updated by our legal counsel when she referred it, reviewed it for us. Okay. Yes. We're gonna make some small changes to this. Does that mean that we're not really on third reading? I, mean, I have it noted for a fourth reading. Yeah, I have a fourth yep. reading. We are on third reading. Yep. So do we want to put the September 1 thing in this policy so we don't have to have another policy or something and it's transparent for everyone? It is the attendance policy, so you get to attend if, I don't know if that's the appropriate place for it, but I don't know where else it would go. I don't remember where it was. Before. And then we don't have to do it every year if it's in here. Yeah. We'll just have it. Yeah, I think it shouldn't be fixed all right in here. Whether it was in here or not. Makes sense to me. Yeah, it makes sense to me too. Make it so. 
Okay, I'll put it in the line. Um, enrolled students. I'll, I'll put it somewhere in the first paragraph. Anywhere. Somewhere that makes sense in the first or paragraph. Or it could even be its own thing. Yeah. Its own paragraph. Okay. Perfect. Are we uh, done with student attendance? Yes. Uh, so moving on to 10, which is update on superintendent evaluation committee. Uh, I'd actually like to appoint a superintendent evaluation committee as well. Okay. Michelle. That was a question I was going to ask. What superintendent <laughs> evaluation yes. committee? Well, we, we, in five tass <laughs> we used to have one. Yeah, we tasked yes. Becky with, with putting together. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so I can give, <laughs> yes. Um, so I'll give a quick update on kind of where we are and uh, what I'd like to see tonight. Uh, and also welcome Libby Bone Steel. Thank you for coming. Uh, but what I'd like to do is appoint the committee. And I think we need to, you know, the committee will help establish the stu superintendent evaluation process. Uh, I want the committee to work closely with Libby on setting up that process. Uh, and then also setting up some of the, I think, initial documents we need, which is a job description, uh, an entry plan, uh, and then setting, <coughs> setting goals for the year on the entry plan. Um, so uh, I'm going to make some nominations for the committee. Um, and uh, so I'd like to appoint the committee and then have them uh, have a meeting and hopefully have at least a job description uh, and then uh, a pathway forward on the other pieces by the July 11th meeting. Okay. Um, and then we can kind of integrate that with the board planning process throughout the summer. Uh, so my nominations are, unless someone else wants to make them, I'd like to nominate Becky as chair, Lisa, Bridget, and myself as kind of an alternate. Or at least a semi official member. Okay. So, and me, Lisa, Bridget, and yourself. Okay. Yeah. Ex officio. Ex officio. <laughs> um, and then Tina asked if Nancy Reed could at least help with setting up some of the early documents. I think that is okay if she, but I don't think she can be an official member and she certainly can't participate in any personnel decisions. So, I think. No, she's been working on these documents that we've got yeah. so far. And just as far as the documents go, not having anything to do with staff. Yeah, so uh, I'm okay with her kind of continuing to, to help at least in the first couple of weeks, but I think beyond that, having a uh, non-board member, even though she's a member of the Montpelier Public Schools Board, uh, is a little awkward. So um, to the extent that she's kind of had some involvement, I would say, you know, wrap that up and and you know, very appreciative of, of her time, but um, but any sort of permanent role I think is, is awkward. Yeah, I think given the sensitive nature of the, yeah, the specific committee, it doesn't make sense to have a citizen yeah. on them. Okay. Jim, can I ask just to clarify, so is this committee a long-standing committee or is this a one-time use sort of committee that's gonna be set up initially for the new superintendentship, the new district, what's the... I, I imagine it's a long, long-term long committee to kind of attend to that, to come to the board, uh, you know, to help with the evaluation process, to help Libby set up a process where, she, you know, we're getting feedback, doing a 360 review, uh, you know, helping her set goals, uh, you know, annually, yep. um, just kind of making sure all that gets done, because I think it's, I think it's too big and cumbersome a task for the whole board to do, especially, you know, the details. And, uh, you know, it's something we haven't done well in the past, so. No, it's very important. I just wanted yeah. to be clear on what the intention was long term. Yeah. Well, and I think that's a great question, because I think generally with a motion to create a, stand a committee, you, you talk about the duration of the committee, the mission of the committee, the membership of the committee. Um, and I think we need to make sure we're clear on all three of those. So we know it's, it's a standing committee, not yeah. ad hoc. We know the membership. That, we're, that you're proposing, and then the mission, just to be very clear, the boundaries of this committee are what, again? Uh, basically to uh, <laughs> set the process, set the process and procedure for superintendent evaluation, 
and then to uh, implement that process and coordinate with the board on kind of the, the high points. But to, you know, to meet with the superintendent periodically on evaluation procedure, on setting goals, et cetera, and then you know, those would all, the, the big points would come up to the, the board. Um, Michelle. Can one of the first, um, I know the, the entry plan is a top priority, obviously, but um, can one of the first or second or third things that this committee does is draft its own charge and then yes. bring that back to the board to approve the charge? Yeah, yeah the and that's what I mean by the process. Like, we're going to work to set up what the process is, and the process will define what the committee actually does. But I think we need to work closely with Libby on that and, and get that in place. Do we need a vote? Mm -hmm. I think we, I think need, we a motion. I need a motion and a vote. So. I move to approve Jim's nominations, assuming that the nominees are amenable to yes. serving. Yes. Okay. Not amenable nominees. <laughs> Second? Aye. Yes. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. And we will um, we will meet hopefully before the 11th and get back with a charge and a job description. Um, and I'll I'll work with you on the schedule. And I know you've got some vacation early as well, too, so we'll work we'll on that. Um, I would move to adjourn, but not to run away real fast. Yeah. Second. Uh, second to. Oh, second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.